of you uh, joining um, from home. Uh, I did uh, have a semi-significant amount of small talk, um, so we'll dispense with that. And I just want to let you know that today we're beginning a video that is going to be like a four or five part uh, demonstration. So we're going to be working on the same demo for quite a while. Um, and uh, what we're doing is we're really sort of building out a scene. So um, I'm looking here at the, um, at the sort of standard document template. I didn't go ahead and open it up um, from the template because we've done that a couple of times. But this is the small objects inches template. Um, can you use the large objects template? Can you work in millimeters? Sure, it's really completely irrelevant um, for this project. I'm just letting you know what I'm, what I'm doing. Um, but it's not necessary, it doesn't matter. Um, and um, let's see, uh, so from in here, I think um, usually there are sort of like two different sort of, um, two different sort of approaches to thinking about designing an environment. Generally, the environment refers to what is there when there is no sort of object, right? So if I maybe like got rid of all of you uh, people and we're just looking in this room, these um, you know, chairs and uh, the chairs and tables, strictly speaking, um, they may or may not be part of the environment depending on how you choose to, to interpret that. Um, so one thing that I like to think about, and I think this is a good place for us to start because we're sort of starting off as a beginner in, um, in Rhino, is um, I like to think about, oh, hello, microphone, sorry, a little, hmm, interesting. I'll have to not move my head very much, everyone. Uh, I'll try. So um, when I'm working in Rhino, usually I actually tend to start with objects. Um, some people I know tend to start with the environment, where they draw the environment and then they want to like kind of conceptualize the objects to go in it. Maybe it's because I have a history as a sculptor, but I tend to make the thing and then make make the thing for the thing to go in. <laughs> but I think it's it doesn't really matter which order you do it in. But we're going to start with objects because it, it sort of demonstrates the tools that we need to learn the most to sort of move on. So so basically, I have this kind of like idea um, for an environment, and it's. Um, I want to kind of draw th some things that maybe look like everyday objects, but also maybe I have a little bit of an element of fantasy. So um, something I think about uh, oh, strangely a lot, um, I have a friend who bought a boat a couple years ago, and um, I, uh, I grew up in Florida, and so yeah, I'm, we're going to make a boat, because boats are awesome, and they're a little thin on the ground here in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I know we do have boats here, yes. It's, not, it's a little different, you know, than it is when you have like a, an ocean, for example. <laughs> so, so we're going to start with a boat, and then we're going to give it some sort of elements to kind of like take it out of its sort of everydayness. So when I say boat, like I'm thinking about um, sort of a traditional like sailboat almost. Um, so uh, I know that this is probably super obvious, but um, if you're looking for um, some ref to make something, if you come up with an idea and say something like, hey, self, I want to make a boat. That's great. What kind of a boat do you want, <laughs> right? Um, and as I'm sure you can guess, there are like probably thousands of different kinds of boats. Um, so it might be a good idea to um, look on Google Images just to kind of give yourself some visual reference. Um, and when I'm designing a project, project like I'll just pull up like low, qual low quality images like this just to kind of give myself an idea of what the shapes look like, right? And what the construction is. I mean, it gives me some sort of like, something to go off of, right? Other than just trying to like pull it out of my head. Um, sometimes pulling things out of your head works, but uh, it's pretty challenging and I pretty much almost never do it. Um, so this is actually like really close to what I'm looking for. Um, this one has already been sort of designed and is, has been made into a game asset. Um, so you can sort of see some of what we're going to be working with. Um, actually, this is extremely similar to my, to my boat. Um, but um, let's go ahead and just maybe like think about this as like a working model. Um, it is definitely sort of like the two-person two -person rowboat, right? Um, and I think when we move on further, I'd like to kind of embellish it with some fanciful sort of details. 
um, to maybe take it out of this kind of super everyday look and make it a little more, um, make it a little more compelling. So if I think about, let's look at this boat. It looks like, um, I'm just gonna look at some other boats too. So I think like something like this, you can see basically that there's sort of three shapes here that we have to be concerned with, right? There's the sidewall, each sidewall, there's this back wall, and then there's also this sort of, uh, we can't see it, but we kind of know that it's there, there's this almost like spine running down the bottom of the boat, right? So that's sort of like, where if I think about like the fundamental structure, that's sort of what we're looking at. Um, when I'm designing things in 3D, by the way, I find it to be a pretty useful to sort of break it down into smaller shapes. So in other words, like look at something like this boat and just think about like what are the simplest shapes that I can use to describe this. Now, you may be saying, but Meg, I wanna make a complicated boat. And I'm like, that's great. You can add in as much complication as you want, but definitely with the sort of 3D design process, thinking of those large, simple shapes will help you create a structure to imp impose detail on later. So, so let's kind of move forward with that. Um, I'm gonna start from the top view, and I'm also gonna be working in one of my side views. Um, so I'm gonna actually change this to the, to the left view. Um, and I can change my mind later, no big deal. So I'm gonna start with this um, control point curve. And um, I'm going ahead and just starting at zero, zero. There's absolutely no reason why you need to do that. It's just kind of a habit of mine. Um, when you do draw things from zero, zero, you're sort of automatically you know, set in the right coordinates to look at it in a lot of different ways. Um, but if you do look at it in another view, it's not really a big deal. So at this point, I'm gonna think about drawing, hmm, let's see, I'm gonna draw sort of like one line to sort of connote the length of the boat. And this is just on the top right now. So this line is just sort of uh, there as a reference for me. I'm also gonna spin this so it's in the right orientation. And I think I'm also gonna now take this curve and I'm just gonna make sort of like a, a curve happen here. I think I want the back to be straight, actually, so I can just click a straight line by clicking the point. And then if I click this point just slightly forward, that basically makes that portion relatively straight. Actually, I wanna do that just a tiny bit differently. So I'm gonna make a straight line. I'm gonna make a single straight line that goes from, let's say, here to here. And then I'm gonna make a curve that goes from here to maybe here to maybe here. And you can see right away, it's, it's not exactly boat-like, like we have a tiny bit of work to do, um, but it sort of goes back to my like, original sort of uh, comment from yesterday where I was saying like, if, you, if you're not confident about how to use the curve tool, just go ahead and use it. Um, and see what happens. And then you can always get in here later and move this curve around and get it exactly where you want it. So right now, if I'm thinking about like how this looks, it doesn't look like awful, but it's not exactly kind of where I want it to be. So I think I want the boat to be longer. So I'm just gonna take this and move this out maybe like this way. And then I'm also gonna take this and make this a tiny bit longer. And I think I'm also going to make that a little bit different like that. Now, I could say, okay, this is like sort of half, excuse me, um, like half of the boat, half of the top of the boat, boat is there now. Um, what would be the easiest way to get this um, and to make it over here, but to make it exactly the same? Well, I could use the endpoints, um, and I could maybe like try to triangulate this point by just estimating where it is on the grid. That sounds terrible, though. Why would I do that? That sounds like a lot of work. Um, there's a much, much easier way to do it, and that is to just take this curve, and I'm gonna mirror it over. So the mirror function in Rhino is in the transformation menu, 
Um, and in the transform menu, there's a bunch of um, transformations that you can apply. Um, pretty much most of these transformation commands, by the way, will apply for, uh, to anything from curves all the way up to solid objects. So um, the cool thing about the transformation menu is that you can use those functions on almost anything. So I'm gonna go ahead and mirror, and it asks me to find an axis. So in this case, it looks like the axis is like already there, right? It's already drawn. Um, so I can actually just use this point as a drawing tool or as an assistance to sort of identify that axis. Um, when I draw in Rhino, and I've, I'm pretty sure um, other people do this a lot too, when I draw in Rhino, um, I tend to draw a lot of pointless curves um, that are not actually pointless. They may look pointless, but they're there basically to like use a snap or to say I wanna you know, have a straight line that I can touch from here to control where this moves or something like that. So you can use these little straight lines um, are actually really helpful just because they give you something to snap to that then becomes like the center, right? And you don't have to find the center every time because it's there. Um, so that's just sort of something that I tend to do. And then we also sort of need this, la there's two other components that we need to kind of like make this sort of thing into an actual frame. Um, we need this swoopy, swoopy line on the bottom, and then we also need some sort of uh, line on the back here. So I think I'm gonna start by making that line on the back. Um, so I'm gonna change this view to the, oh, front view, and let's see. So probably a good way to do it is just with my freeform curve tool. Um, now, I'm being kind of like super careful right now because this is like, uh, you know, a boat. Um, people tend to have this expectation of symmetry, right? Because it's a industrially designed object. So, so if I draw a shape, I have to make sure that it's exactly the same on both sides. So we're just gonna kind of address that. So I'm gonna make a curvy shape here and maybe I'll close it. That'll be my last point for that. And then with this, I can go ahead and mirror this again just to make sure that that curve is 100% identical. So I'm gonna use that mirror function again. And here, by the way, in the mirror function, the axis would be right here. So we have this endpoint. And then we also still have um, this. Now, someone who was not only looking at the front viewport may have noticed that that curve kind of went awry. Um, did anyone else notice? I hope probably everyone probably noticed it besides me. Um, so this curve kind of went awry when I was drawing it. That's a super common problem. I can, show you, I can show you how to fix it. So the easy way to fix it would be to just probably start over. Um, I think that um, that might actually be the easiest way to do it. The other way would be to just take these control points and make sure that they align on the same point. Um, when you do that, you're likely to sort of like not get exactly what you want. Um, so probably starting over is the best thing to do. Now, let's think of just for a second about how to prevent that from happening again. So it goes back to something I talked about like on day one, I think. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start drawing my form so I can illustrate what went wrong. So you can see what's happening here. If you look at the other views, my point selection looks awesome in the front view. And I'm just like rocking along. I'm like, hey, hey, this is fine. You know, like everything's cool, but, but no, it's like, it's not cool. <laughs> Obviously um, it's, you know, magnetizing to all of these planar views. So, so the thing to do to fix that is there's an adjustment in the, um, in your sort of work preferences here. Um, if you click on planar, um, now when we draw this curve, you will see that it should be, hello. Right, so. So 
basically, um, one of the things that is happening now is we have grid snap on. Um, and I think it would be really nice if we didn't have grid snap on. And uh, so part of the reason is that the um, grid is just kind of magnetizing. And then the other thing that we're doing a little bit wrong right now is um, we have a smart track um, and our object snaps enabled. So it actually seems like um, it's not behaving 100% the way it should. Um, usually when you click this box for planar, it will limit it to the planar, to the actual plane that you're sort of um, working on. So um, let's go ahead and just grab this curve point. So basically I want my so snaps on so that I can grab this point. So I'm gonna turn the object snaps on, those are down here. You can see end is selected. This is an end point. It's also near, works just fine too. Um, sometimes with endpoints, there'll be like several different kinds of points in one, so it'll come up with a bunch of those options. I'm gonna go ahead and click this point, and what happens is um, you can see that it's kind of out of, out of plane, basically, it's not planar. Um, so that's actually kind of a slightly interesting problem. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and disable the O snaps. And I'm gonna go ahead and then just click this in. Fascinating. So yeah, that's not supposed to do that. Um, so right now I have all of my snaps off. So I'm just trying to kind of reset them. Um, Probably another good thing to do. Um, oh, well, this is like maddeningly frustrating because this is like the most simple thing that we could possibly do. Um, hmm? The front view. Oh. Oh, I have things rotated. Yeah, you're totally right. Okay, so then it's my fault. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, yeah, so that makes total sense. Yay. Um, 3D perception is hard. Um, so basically, uh, that's a, that's a good sort of solution to that problem, which is that my this is the front view, so it's actually looking at this. Um, I, to I totally did not even realize that I had flipped this 90 degrees. So yeah, let's go ahead and rotate this. So I just selected everything by sort of grabbing it. Um, and to rotate it, probably it would be good, a good idea to just rotate it on zero, zero. So I can grab this middle point here. And then this would be my first, I wanna hit the shift key so it'll click into ortho, which limits things to 90 degrees. Um, so if I hit the shift key here, it'll click that zero point, and then I can transform it by rotating it up. Um, when you hit this ortho button, it limits to 90 degrees. You can also do it by um, just hitting the shift key on your keyboard. It'll have the same effect. So now let's get back in here and try to draw this line. Um, still not planar, so let me click the planar button. So a couple things are things that I'm just thinking about. Um, as I look at this, and this is just kind of like a sort of classic rhino problem, like what you see in the front view is not really a great representation of where these points are. So when you draw the curve, you can actually select the point back here or in any other viewport, right? And then you can come down here and start to kind of work on your, your shape. And this is looking right now very planar and very exactly like it should be. So uh, that's good. It means that the universe has not imploded. Um, 
But yeah, definitely. Also, this would be a great just occasion because I actually am, as we've said before, I'm really interested in sort of flipping this and making it symmetrical. This would be a great occasion to activate grid snap because this point is just like waiting here for me to provide me with some of that precision. Um, and then we can just hit enter. And so from here, now we can flip this again. So let's go to the transform function. I think this was where I discovered that it wasn't coplanar last time. Um, so that's a funny kind of term that you'll hear a lot in 3D design, uh, coplanar or planarity. Um, it basically means that all of the points are on the same flat plane. Um, so right now, all of these yellow points are coplanar. These pl points over here, not, right? They're on a different plane. So, um, so in Rhino, the reason that planarity is a big deal, and I actually took the time to fix it um, and make it right, is because um, in Rhino, if, if you want things to be planar and they're not, you, there are certain functions that you won't be able to use in Rhino, and certain sort of transformation functions won't work and things like that. So, so if you want something to be planar, um, it's good to kind of know that. So, okay, so start of the mirror plane, we could probably start it right down here and then use this point up here. We could also just use any perpendicular point. So, so now we sort of have the back of the boat. Um, I wanted to draw the back of the boat first because uh, without the back of the boat, we don't really have the, the, the lower point, right? So sometimes when you're drawing stuff, especially in Rhino, you sometimes you have to draw stuff to draw stuff, right? So in other words, maybe you just, we could have also just drawn a line, right? Like a simple straight line to say, well, this is where we want the bottom of the boat to be, right? Without defining that, like there's no way that we can really move forward. So um, I'm gonna use this point and I'm just gonna use the curve thing. Again, um, it's good that we worked this out because this whole project kind of relies on um, planar shapes. So, so if, if that hadn't worked, that would have been pretty much like a disaster for today. Um, but what we want to do is just go ahead and make a planar shape that is kind of planar from the right view. So here, we can click this point, and then I'm going to go down a little bit to give it some a little bit of a curve. And then I'm going to end it right there. And so this is going to be sort of like our, um, the sort of framework of our boat. And at this point, this is a good point to sort of think about maybe there are some design changes that we want to make. So as I'm looking at it, um, it looks weirdly shallow. Um, the boat just looks like it's like maybe not deep enough. So um, there's two changes I would need to make to, to make that happen. I would have to change this back piece, and I'm also going to have to change this sort of undercarriage. So I'm going to start here and just make this a little bit deeper. And then I think I can probably start here and just pull this one down a little bit. Um, I'm going to hit the shift key when I pull this down because I don't want to pull it like any of these places, right? I just want to pull it straight down. So if I hit the shift key, I can activate that ortho thing and get this to go straight down. So I've still got one more thing to do, and that is we've got to extend this bit to kind of make it fit this. Um, and probably there are two different things that we could do here. One is we could go ahead and just join these two lines, and that would effectively make them one single line. Um, probably easier to do is to go ahead and delete one and just make the changes to one and then copy it over. So here... I'm going to put this down here, and then I have to kind of rethink the curve a little bit. So um, you also might notice that something went slightly awry there. Um, I might have to do a tiny bit of research to find out if there's like a setting that they changed um, that might be uh, sort of shifting it in this phase where it doesn't want to be coplanar. Um, so let me just demonstrate, as I moved this point down, um, I believe that it magnetized uh, kind of over this way. Um, and so that's not really super helpful. Um, what's more helpful is if we can just take this point straight down. So, um, and we can do that. We just, part of it is um, that 
when you're working in Rhino, I mean, it's kind of maybe goes without saying, but you have to really like pay attention. Um, so for example, like if I'm, you know, just like looking at the front view and looking at like at you guys and, you know, I might not just like no notice something on the side. And every time you work in Rhino, you kind of have to be in four places at once, right? Um, so it's, it is a tiny bit maybe like having eyes in the back of your head. Um, so I'm just going to spend some time with this curve and just kind of get it to look a little bit less weird. Um, and so you can see it's um, aligned with the bottom point. Um, of course, you know, it looks like it's not aligned with the bottom point, which is one of the reasons why I find the perspective view to be really useful. And I basically just kind of store it here. Um, and then I kind of just constantly like spin this around just to double check, like, okay, that's touching that. You know, it's not going this way or whatever. So constantly having the perspective view available to sort of check is, is helpful. So pretty much this time we could just take this form and uh, mirror it again. Um, start of plane is here, and then we can just um, accept that. And so let's go ahead and get to the point where we're kind of like refining those surfaces. Now, I said it was a good point for us to make changes to our design. There's not necessarily like a bad point for that or a bad moment for that. Um, we can certainly like make strong changes to this after we make the surfaces. Um, but I think it's just sort of a truism in design <laughs> is that like the further along the design process you get, the, the more difficult it is to make changes um, just because of the nature of like, you know, complexity building up as you go along. So, so here we've got a few sort of ways that we can make surfaces that we talked about last week, but we're going to talk about um, a couple of those. We might talk about some new ones. Probably the most obvious two surfaces that I can think of where we could sort of conceptualize a surface in our minds, one would be this top area right here. Um, we do kind of want the boat to be open eventually, but I think we're going to go ahead and fill in that top surface. And again, this is like drawing things to draw things. We're going to put the top surface there so we can hollow it out. Um, and then uh, here, we're going to probably, this would just be like a straight, flat, it's a flat shape, right? It's a flat, planar surface. So this is probably another like really easy um, surface to make. So, there's um, a curve here that happens to be like a little standalone curve. So we've got these three curves make a planar surface. So we can come in here to surface and uh, use the planar curves function. And of course, it's saying no faces were made because I accidentally had one se uh, selected. Let's just try that one more time. So then it asks you to select the planar curves to build surfaces. So we can just select these three curves and hit enter. Done. Easy, easy. That's pretty much, I think, like the easiest way to make a surface. Um, unless you count just like drawing a, bo drawing a box. Um, and then we can actually use the same method for the top here, right? So all we need to do is sort of select these three surfaces, three curves. Um, I don't think I've had a chance to mention this before, but you may, as you get into drawing objects that are slightly more complex, you may see this choose objects menu. And basically what this menu is telling you is, hey, there's a couple of things in the place where you clicked. Could you please tell me what you actually want? Okay? So, so in this case, it's got a curve. Well, that is what I actually want. And then the surface, which highlights in pink. So if none of those things are the things that you wanted and you want to start over, you can click none, and then it will just reset the selection. So in this case, we're going to select the curve. And now we have pretty much what we need to make a planar curves here. So if I go into uh, planar curves once again, now this time they're already selected, so it just automatically does it for me. Um, pretty much a lot of those um, a lot of the functions in Rhino, if you have stuff selected and you know that it's what you should have selected, you can just go through the process and it won't prompt you to select things. Um, I actually kind of like selecting things in the surface creation functions 
because it lets me be a, a little bit more precise. Um, and yeah, so here, now we've got two more surfaces, or one, depending on how you uh, are tracking it. So what we need is, we have the edges of this surface, which are basically these three curves, right? So this surface is gonna be a little bit different than the other two that we made, right? So it has some qualities. One, it is not coplanar. It's not all on the same plane. Um, that's not a bad or a good thing, it just, Rhino will treat it differently. Um, the other thing that we sort of have to think about is maybe like, do, you might wanna think about this ahead of time a little bit, do we want the surface to fit exactly um, these curves? Pretty much always the answer is yes. So I'm gonna try a method called edge curves. Um, sometimes, you know, this says creates, creates a surface from two or three or four edge curves. Now, I'm like 98% sure that this is gonna work, but I do just wanna kinda like give you the caveat that when you're selecting like random stuff in Rhino, every once in a while, it'll just say, failed. Like, down here on the, down here on the status bar, it'll say, failed to create surface. Um, and basically, it might just mean that like there's some mathematical error when your forms come together or something like that. Um, if you do get an error like that, I would double check what you've selected and make sure that what you've selected you know, meets the criteria that the function is asking for. And then if, it's, if you still have problems, that would be a great thing to kind of like email me or the TA about if you have trouble with that. So in this case, I'm fairly confident um, and we should be able to run an edge curves. And yay, it did work. So, so with edge curves, it's a little bit more of a complex surface. Um, as you can see, it's got you know, a lack of flatness, which is kind of awesome. Um, and we could go ahead and sort of like think about this as a part of our boat. Um, probably, I think that we could do the exact same thing with this surface as with this. So this is sort of like, I think all roads are going to lead to Rome. We could, um, we could mirror this over here, or we could just create a surface from scratch. Probably exactly the same amount of work. So I'm just gonna grab the three curves, and then um, once again, use that edge curves function. Okay, awesome. So now we have something that, uh, Sorry, y'all, it actually looks a little bit more like a speedboat than a rowboat, but you know, I'm, I'm we're trying. Um, but basically, like, I think it would be nice at this point to like, take the boat and actually put some stuff in the boat. Um, we're gonna play around with materials and tiling on, you know, put wood on it and everything. Um, probably this idea of hollowing out the boat and maybe sticking something else in there, I think we can squeeze that in in the next couple minutes. So to hollow out the boat, um, a couple of things might, you might wanna do. So if I just select everything, it looks like um, I've selected seven curves and four surfaces. So it just so happens that in this moment, I'm really only concerned with selecting the surfaces. So there's something you can do in Rhino that allows you to sort of, excuse the, t I don't know if this even qualifies as a pun, um, selectively select uh, things. It's totally not even a pun. Um, so what do I mean? Well, it's like if I just want to select the surfaces, I can go in here to the edit select objects menu and say, hey, only get the surfaces. That's nice. Um, so, and you can do that for pretty much any shape category in Rhino if you just wanna select curves or just wanna select anything else. Um, so I'm actually gonna select the curves. Um, which is a little bit different. So I have these seven curves here. And obviously you can all can see how important those curves were to making this boat thing, a set of surfaces. But I'm kind of done with them. A am I done with them? <laughs> like, no, you're like, yes. Um, 
That's difficult to say. <laughs> um, so I, my, this is sort of like one of my recommendations from many years of experience. Um, I would save everything um, because if you wanted to make a change to this polysurface or this surface, it would be way easier to actually just change the curves and make it from scratch than it would be to try to modify it, right? Yes. do that. You're like psychic. You are. All right. So yeah, we're going to do layers. So, so basically, Rhino has a layers interface. So right now, I have those curves selected. And basically, what I do with my, um, I have a layer in all of my Rhino files called CC. And it's just my private code to myself for construction curves. And it's basically like all of the crap that I generate in Rhino that isn't part of the design, but that I might want to save to use later. So if I have these curves selected, I can just go into this layer, um, right click or you know, double tap, and then you can say um, change object layer. And the nice thing about that is that then you can make all that stuff invisible. Um, so right now we're on. Um, we're on this layer, and it actually looks like it brought my sur surfaces with me as well. So I'm going to grab these surfaces and just stick them on a different layer. Um, so I think when I did that, I might have had everything selected. So um, again, I want, now I want to take these surfaces and take them off of this layer so I can say change object layer here. Um, and now, um, if I just sort of um, separate these, um, you can see that I can turn off the um, that I can turn off those curves pretty easily. Um, so yeah, there's always some people call it a, like a trash bin or whatever. I don't. It doesn't matter what you call it, but I do think it's a good idea to save um, some of these curves that you generate because otherwise you kind of have to go all the way back to the drawing board, which is kind of a bummer. Um, so now, I basically just keep this layer in here. I keep it invisible. And it, it's just kind of like a repository for all that stuff. So now we're back to these sort of five surfaces, uh, or four surfaces, rather. Let me double check. Yeah, four surfaces. And we had said something about trying to hollow this boat out. So definitely um, thinking about hollowing it out, I would say, is uh, good idea. We're going to use the um, shell command for that. So if I use the shell command, it says select faces to remove from closed poly surface. Um, well, definitely I want to remove this sort of covering on the top, this top surface. So, ah, uh, right. So the shell command in this case is asking for a closed poly surface. And when I select this, you may notice that it says it's four surfaces. So that's not really the same thing, right? It's not a closed poly surface. So how do I make it a closed poly surface? That's a great question. Um, you use the essential step of going to the, now let me just say, first of all, when we created this, remember how we took great pains to like make everything line up and make all the snaps work so everything is definitely like touching? Okay. That's, that's thing one that has to happen. Thing two is going up here to the solid menu and saying create solid. Um, oh, unable to create solid. So when it says it's unable to create solid, that is an indication that there's some kind of a gap. Um, and that's a super bummer. Um, so what's a person to do? Well. Unfortunately, that's like one of the worst things that can happen in Rhino. Um, probably what I would do is bring these curves back and um, just take a really close look at everything and make sure that everything is touching. So um, probably I think that this might take a couple of minutes. Uh, it might take more than two minutes. Um, I'm going to do a visual inspection. It looks like. As you can see, it looks like everything's touching. Um, so probably one more time, I'm just going to um, make these uh, surfaces and uh, see if they generate in a different way. 
You know what, repeating the same thing twice and expecting different results? I've heard something about that before. Yeah. Okay. So fill that one in. And then, let's see. Um, I'm going to join these before I make that planar surface, just because I can. Not that I think it will have any major effect. Um, but at this point, um, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that these curves are, are, are sort of not in that selection. Um, another thing that can cause a create solid, like a failure to create a solid, is if like I were to select these four things, and then I also had a curve in there, and then I told it to create a solid, Rhino's not smart enough to sort of like know that um, that's a problem. So this is a little bit of a mystery at this point. Um, I'm gonna do just like a, so sometimes when I get into this situation, um, it's not a terrible idea to just kind of draw a box um, and just double check that this is even a solid. So I'm gonna break it apart and try using the create solid function on this. Um, and that was successful. So that means that there is definitely some sort of slight problem here. So um, probably the best thing to do would be for me to take some time after class and sort of figure out why this is generating that error. Um, basically, I mean, the short form is at some point, some of these points are not touching. And I'm, I'm kind of guessing that it was when we were having that problem with coplanarity um, that maybe one of these um, shapes didn't get drawn so that it touches quite right. So, um, so I'll take a couple of minutes because I ha basically like have to resolve that to move on. Um, so then uh, next Tuesday, I can kind of re report back like where I found the dreaded gap. Um, and uh, we can just sort of maybe like talk about some reasons why that is a thing that can sometimes happen. Um, as far as uh, shelling this out, um, the plan for Tuesday is that we're gonna shell it out, we're gonna put a cooler in the back, we're gonna start working on the actual shape form of the environment. Um, and I was kind of hoping to like make us like a like a sailing, you know, mast for this thing that looks like a narwhal horn. Um, so that's my plan. Um, but yeah, as you can see, Rhino sometimes has other ideas. Um, yeah, I'll see you on Tuesday. And uh, I'll, if I if I get this figured out, I might even put a little uh, technical addendum video or something up. So uh, have a great weekend, everybody.